So uh, my name is Shane Coughlin. I'm the general manager of the Open Chain project. Um, and we are an open source project that doesn't make code. We work on standards and all the types of ancillary stuff around standards that you need, reference material, self-certification, and an ecosystem. Uh, when you think of something like standards in play in a market, uh, you will normally think of something that's intercompany. But I'm going to take the optic of how standards uh, in our case can be very useful from an inner source perspective. So I'm going to talk about open chain, open chain standards, how they apply to open source, and how they apply to what you're doing. Martin, let's spin along to the next slide. So the Open Chain project has two standards that it maintains. And the first original and most famous is probably an ISO standard we've built. So it's Open Chain ISO IEC 5230-2020. That pithy name is normally brought down to ISO 5230. It's been in market as an ISO standard since 2020. It's been out there as a de facto industry standard since 2016. And it is designed to help people address open source license compliance. Now there's many ways you can go about that. One way is to have very long checklists. Uh, and another way is to go in the opposite direction, which is where we went and created a process standard that helps people understand what are the key things they need to do to manage something like open source license compliance? So ISO 5230 is a light process standard defining the key requirements of a quality open source license compliance program. That sounds incredibly boring, and uh, it, it is in many ways, but we have a bigger play here. If you're dealing with any open source, you have to deal with open source licenses. Having a program in place reduces a lot of headaches. So we're talking about reducing or completely avoiding common issues. Um, and there's really two reasons you want to do that. One is that if you have problems, it's going to slow down your product or service releases and support. And the other, as the lawyers would like to remind you at all times, is that it reduces legal risk and that's a good thing. This standard, I would say is something, <laughs> Martin's getting trigger happy. <laughs> get back, 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 back. Get back to my first slide. One back, one back, one back. We're still on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, this standard is uh, designed uh, to be very, very light. And if you are familiar with technical standards, you'll be familiar with hundreds of pages of daunting uh, stuff. In our case, you're looking at approximately seven pages with plenty of white space. So we're really, really simple standard. And when it comes to a quality open source license compliance program, you're talking about knowing what stuff is inbound, having training, having some processes internally and knowing what's going outbound. That's the fundamentals. When it comes to how this standard has played out in the market, we've seen substantial adoption. Uh, to give you a metric, PwC did a survey with Bitcom in 2021, and they found that 20% of entities in Germany that they surveyed with more than 2,000 employees were using this ISO standard. Uh, most recent conformance announcements would include companies like, uh, we've got Google just announcing adoption of the ISO version of the standard in December, and throughout last year, just a ton of companies, uh, some cherry picking from around the world, would be that we had ZTE in China announce conformance. We had BlackBerry in North America announce conformance. Um, and in Europe, we had quite a few different entities announce conformance, not least those who uh, were working closely with Martin and his team at Source Code Control. But let's not get bogged down on this standard. Let's shoot to that next slide. The second standard that we deal with at the Open Chain Project is a sister standard. It's a security standard. Uh, it's been in market since last year. We started working on it in 2021. Uh, it's already been submitted to ISO via JTC1 and a type of fast track. So it's expected to become an ISO standard next year. This year, we're in 2023. This year, 
<laughs> um, and it's very, very similar to the license compliance standard. Uh, if open source license compliance is your thing, ISO 5230. If open source security is your thing, the security assurance spec is what you need. Again, it's around seven pages. It defines the key requirements of a quality open source security assurance program. And it does the avoiding issues uh, that slow you down and avoiding legal risks. Now let's move into the next slide. How these come together, these two sister standards, is uh, that they work with the idea of making the supply chain better. And our goal was to have program by program uh, operating in whatever domain you decide. And the intent is that you link programs in a supply chain and everything goes well. The first way you think about this and the most common way to think about supply chains is that companies are doing business with each other. And as each company has, let's say, a license compliance program and a security assurance program, and they link up in the supply chain, less issues happen. But of course, this also applies to inner source. Similar benefits are available to departments inside companies. If different departments are interoperating with each other, if they're sharing code, they need to have programs in place to reduce friction. So basically, anytime software needs managing, these standards are designed to help if it's license compliance or security. Let's dive into the next slide. Okay, uh, when it comes to using standards like these, uh, you're, you're looking at a situation where probably your company either has some stuff in place or doesn't have stuff in place, but quite frequently isn't involved in using these standards yet. Uh, to address this, our project has extensive resources. We have a ton of reference material and we have self-certification material and a very active community. To give you some optics onto that, we keep our reference material on GitHub and we have over a thousand documents, including translations into multiple languages. For each of the standards, there's self-certification checklists and questionnaires freely available, as well as an online self-certification web app for the license compliance standard. Our community has got a US and Europe monthly call, a Europe Asia monthly call, and it has uh, work groups and special interest groups and local user groups all around the world uh, operating on a frequent cadence. Our tooling work group meets every two weeks, our telco monthly, our automotive every two to three months, and the local groups, for instance, uh, in China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, India, Germany, UK, uh, these work groups meet on a cadence of normally two to three months. We are open to everyone. Uh, this goes to our education material. It goes to how we edit and create the standards. Anyone can turn up and be part of this. So, you know, you find companies in there who are really concerned about dealing with their supply chain. You find companies that are concerned about dealing with internal matters only. Everyone's at the table, everyone's welcome, everyone's voice is heard. Our reference material, except case studies, because obviously they say things like, this is what Toyota does, this is what Interneuron does. Um, the case studies are not public domain, but everything else is via CC0 licensing. So you can take it, use it. You don't have to give credit to us. Uh, you can just take our open source training slides, our policy documents, whatever, and do whatever you want with it. And of course, we've got a global community of law firms, service providers, tooling vendors and certifiers if you want and need third-party support. It's a pretty big ecosystem and we manage it with a global calendar that is uh, available on the first page of our website, which I'll flag in a minute. But let's go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the key takeaways I'd like you to have as we begin to sum up here is that what I've just mentioned with these standards is that they're out in the market and they're useful and they help people. Uh, and that's because the standards are designed to work in a very practical way. User companies built them for user company problems. When we think about the kind of challenges that people have dealing with open source license compliance and security, what we face inside companies is very similar to what we face between companies. 
And we did take this into account when making these standards. We're well aware of that in large companies, by way of example, departments might be shipping not just source code, but just binary with each other, whatever, and they effectively have an internal supply chain. These are supply chain standards. Reinventing the wheel and spinning up your own licensing and security solution is eminently possible, but it is unnecessary. And it does introduce complexity from the supply chain optic. If you're operating in complete isolation, it's probably fine. If you're operating with other parties, it's better to standardize your approach to reduce the amount of friction where things don't interconnect perfectly. The alternative that we offer to trying to work things out on your own is thousands of resource hours spent developing these standards, trying to find the quickest and most effective approaches based on decades of experience. Um, and I think that you'll find when you have a look at the standards and you look at what we do with them, that that is the case. When I talked about the license compliance standard, I mentioned that, for instance, you know, Google was the most recent company to announce adoption of the ISO version. They had announced adoption of the de facto industry standard in 2019 before it became an ISO standard. Uh, that's a very large entity and it's a very sophisticated entity, but that is just one example. If you want a completely different example, our security assurance standard had its first formal conformance announcement just a few days ago, and that was Interneuron in the UK, uh, in collaboration with Martin here on the call and source code control. Interneuron is not a big company, uh, but it is a company which has a strong focus on not only trying to have sustainable software, but making sure that the parties that they work with, and they focus on the British National Health Service, have a really good way to manage software over the very long term. I hope you can take a look at our standards and see how they can be useful for you in the inner source um, optic. I'm confident that will happen easily and quickly. I'm also confident that if you are interested in this and you can come over to our community and you know, provide some insight, we will continue to hone and improve the onboarding we have for inner source parties. Let's move to the final slide. Uh, basically, just go to our website, openchainproject.org have a look at the standards, join our calls, take our reference material. And you can contact me at any time at scoughlin at linuxfoundation.org. Uh, we are a very open source project. I mean, we develop our standards by editing on our monthly calls. Uh, we publish everything on GitHub. This is the right place to come to work with your peers. Uh, we're very, very friendly to new participants. Um, and like I said, there's no barriers to entry at all. But what I'm going to do now is hand over to our more practical implementation guy and pass to Martin for his section of the presentation, where he's going to talk about a little bit more detail stuff. All right, Martin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Shane. Uh, first of all, apologies. Uh, I'm carrying a bit of a cold, so my voice is not the best. But uh, hopefully we can get through the presentation and hopefully a picture speaks a thousand words. So uh, as Shane said, I'm just going to talk about some practical ways you can think about applying you know, the theory of open chain to the context of inner source. So before I get into the contents, just a bit of background on what we do as a company. So we're UK headquartered, been trading since 2014. Uh, we provide a range of services uh, related to pretty much all wrapped around uh, open chain now. When, when we started, there was no open chain. There was very little best practice about how to manage open source and software supply chains. So we actually did set out to try and initiate that. And I got introduced into Shane when he was starting open chain. And now all our services that we do, we, we do in the context of open chain. So we, we offer services like we've got a training program, which we do face to face. We do it remotely. We just recently recorded it and put it online as self-paced training. Uh, but we find that kind of a fundamental part of our service. Our experience is that particularly large organizations, there's inconsistent level of knowledge about particularly open source licensing and what the obligations are. So we've, we always try to start you know, a project with the fundamental of training. And then we help companies adopt the principles of open chain. And if they want to go through the whole 
can form this program, we we would go on that journey with them, uh, or we just do the elements of what's required by Open Chain, which I'll, I'll talk about. We also do services related to um, kind of investment scenarios, mergers and acquisitions, where we're either working on behalf of an investor or a buyer, or working with software companies looking to seek investment or to exit. It's where we audit code and highlight, you know, what third party components libraries are in code, what are the issues and risks that need to be considered. Um, and that is quite interesting. We have never done a project where there haven't been issues that need to be addressed. And quite often it delays decisions in that area. And then that leads on to a lot of companies like Shane talked about a company called Interneuron who we work with. A lot of companies haven't got the knowledge or the capacity or the resources to manage this. They're focused on uh, developing their solutions. So we offer all of our services kind of as a managed service. So as Shane was talking about, there's, there's, there's always a supply chain, whatever the scenario, whether it's proprietary software, open source software, whether it's software an organization is bringing into their organization as a packaged package software from mainstream vendor or it's in a source in-house developed software there's always a supply chain that's always sitting somewhere uh, either in the middle beginning or the end of a, a supply chain and those supply chains can bring potential risk into an organization and the two risks we kind of focus on which Shane talked about uh, related to open chain are intellectual property licensing and copyright issues. So all the third party libraries, frameworks and so on and so on that developers use to build a solution, whether it's developers outside your organization that you brought in, those licenses have obligations which could create a copyright risk to uh, you know, the organization where the software is coming to. And that was the starting point of open chain and a big focus area for us. And then the other issue is the issue of known vulnerabilities in components and libraries coming into applications, coming into an organization, which can later be exploited and produce a risk. And because of particularly security uh, risk in that supply chain, there's been some very extensive and high profile uh, exploits caused by uh, open source components in particular being exploited. We're shifting from an era of we should manage this. So uh, what I mean by that is when we started in 2014, I can hand on heart say not one company said we shouldn't be managing this as an issue. However, they always had more burning issues. We're shifting into an era where there's, there's an increasing regulation forcing companies to manage the situation. And in, in our world, where we work with um, third party organizations as our customers, uh, they're very much on the back foot of how they're going to address some of these regulations, which are, I'll talk about. So our customers range from small companies to global manufacturing pharmaceuticals. And so it's global companies where this is becoming a real uh, a big issue. Now there's a common theme across the regulations coming out and the term software bill of materials is probably in the security world of software development been the number one topic, definitely in the last six months, if you look at security and software development online magazines. So, some of the regulations you, you may have come across if you deal with the US, there was a, a White House executive order uh, aimed at improving the nation's cybersecurity, uh, which had various things in there, but included a section that said any software supplied to government organizations should be accompanied with a software bill of materials, which is basically an inventory of what third party code is in the code of the solutions being delivered. Uh, we're seeing the EU uh, mirroring that. So they've got in draft the EU Cyber Resilience Act, which again includes 
this, this requirements that any software supplied to government institutions should have a software bill of materials. And they'd already published guidance, for instance, in areas of IoT and cloud, there should be software bill of materials associated with software. You see it in finance, for instance, the payment card industry, you see it in, in medical, so the FDA have for many years published stuff in, in this area. So the White House Executive Order has actually been passed into a bill. So it's a Department of Homeland Security bill. And around April this year, there will be this requirement that software provided to US government institutions have to have a software bill of material that's attested. So basically, the company supplying the software will be signing off on the accuracy of the bill of materials. And the idea is, if you've got a situation where there's a new vulnerability announced, like say Log4j, which is quite high, high profile fairly recently, then the end user organization can look in the bill of materials and see if Log4j is in the code and therefore what actions they need to take to address that working with the software supplier. Um, what we're seeing is procurements of organizations now adopting the same principle. So we're working with a, um, a global manufacturing company and they do a lot of software development themselves. So internally, uh, all their software development teams produce a software bill of materials for the software that they're producing, but they have hundreds of software companies supplying software into the organization. They're, they're going to mandate contractually that all those suppliers have to be conformance with Open Chain, uh, which is great for Shane and his project, but also they have to provide a software bill of materials. Um, so that's going to impact a lot of organizations. Part of our role working with that company is to help those suppliers deal with that and you know how are, gonna, how are they going to adopt open chain um, every company is different they've got different tools and processes that they need to leverage so that, that's an issue and like i said the eu had this cyber resilience act they're saying the same sort of thing software bill of materials so it's common theme of software bill of materials software bill of materials now open chain is a process standard and you could break it down into a number of pillars of the requirements. The first one, as a company, so not an individual within the company, but as a company from your development perspective, does everybody understand the responsibilities created by the use of third party components and libraries? And every company will be different to what their risk is, you know, the types of software that's being developed. But basically you should have a policy uh, some companies don't like using the word policy, but it should be a guide, guidance to developers about the do's and don'ts of using third party components and libraries in software development. And everybody existing and anybody new coming into uh, the development organization should be trained on that policy and fully understand it. Um, and then somebody should be responsible for supporting those developers but also dealing with any issues so for instance a developer wants to use a a package or a components and it's not covered in the policy where do they go what do they do so you might have a, a program office and then a source program office open source program office it deals with that you might have an individual who's responsible for dealing with those issues and then finding the answer but that should be in place and accessible to everybody who needs it the third one, which is related to the software bill of materials, is can you accurately identify all the third party code in your code? So components, libraries, frameworks, maybe code snippets. Have you got visibility of all that? And then whenever you deliver whatever the solution is that's been coded, are you meeting the obligations of the licenses? and any other obligations that might be required of all those third party components used in, in the code. And the final piece is if you allow developers representing the company to contribute to 
external open source projects is that done in a structured way that protects the organization. So for instance, signing over copyright ownership to the projects and things like that. Or if you are open sourcing any of the software you're working on, is that done in a structured way? So that's the principles of open source. As I say, it's a process standard. And obviously the devil would be in the detail of how you implement those processes. So for us, it starts with education. Um, there is a, a curriculum for open chain and we've created a training course around that and other, other related training courses, but getting everybody on the same page. So uh, legal, you could have uh, people in an open source program office or an open source program office, people, representatives from the engineering team, have they all got the same level of knowledge about what needs to be done to manage open source and how your organization is going to do that? And then that feeds into what do we need in a policy? You've probably already got engineering guidelines and coding standards of your own. So it could be complementary to that, or it could be a standalone policy or guide about the do's and don'ts of open source. Um, and then, like I said, with software composition analysis, you need to have accurate data to identify what's in your code, which is the um, software bill of materials. And that could be automated. So it's self-fulfilling, self-managing on a continuous basis. And you only need to tweak the process to keep it working with the latest changes. And you can then report off the back of that. So if, if for instance, with the executive order, a an end user or a department within your company says what's in the code, you can provide a software bill of materials and it shouldn't be an onerous issue. So if you adopt open chain, you've got that. And it's relevant whether it's you're sharing code across departments and that code might make it external anyway. Um, so it does have a relevance to, to inner source from my perspective anyway. And then if you look at that from a project level, you can automate a lot of those things. You know, some of the latest tools like commercial software composition analysis tools, you can take a document which is a policy with the rules and you can put those rules in in the technology so you can shift left into the design phase if you like so if, if you've educated all your developers say for this project we can't use certain licenses because it's a, a risk to the organization then they should be able to be avoiding using those components in the first place so you probably avoided creating a risk in the first place. But then if a developer was to pull in a component or a supplier was to provide you some software with a component that breaches the policy, the tool should be able to flag that for you automatically. And you can deal with it early in the design and development cycle, which is easier to deal with than if you've already shipped software to, to across your organization or even out to, to customers. But each phase of the development cycle, you can pick up issues, security vulnerabilities or licenses that are acceptable. And then at the very end, you can generate an accurate bill of materials, which you can share across departments. So say for instance, a department's developed a solution, another department's looking to leverage that and maybe develop it into something else. You can reference the bill of materials so you can see what's in the code, are there any licenses? Are there any security vulnerabilities? Are there any components that we shouldn't be using in the new development, which is in the code that's being shared? And right at the beginning of that process, you can see what needs to be avoided or changed in the code you're taking, which obviously will make you more efficient. And if you look at this from a kind of a higher level, you can think of all these code repositories that you're making available to share. Every one of the code repositories has an associated software bill of materials, and they've been developed under a, a published policy, which everybody's aware of. Then it's easier to understand what's in the code, how it's been coded, uh, what shouldn't be there. Therefore, it makes the sharing of code from, from various applications that you're sharing easier. And then if you have situations like there's a new vulnerability, uh, so it's pressed that there's a, a found a vulnerability into a certain component, 
then you could interrogate the bill of materials for all the code repositories to see if those that component, vulnerable component, exists anywhere in any code in your organization, which obviously is a good thing to proactively manage um, you know, you know, the risk within the company. So you've got complete transparency. So there's loads of benefits of adopting this sort of process on a continuous basis. So just to summarize, um, first of all, I say it enables you to proactively deal with issues like, like I just talked about. It's ever-changing landscape we see license changes. So, for instance, Elasticsearch and MongoDB changed their licensing strategy, uh, which impacts a lot of our customers who develop cloud solutions. There's vulnerabilities being found all the time. There's recently a vulnerability in OpenSSL 3.0, uh, Log4j situation. And we're still working with companies with the vulnerable version of Log4j in their code because they just didn't know it was in their code in the first place. So, that, so they're Kind of vulnerable to being exploited. So you can be more proactive. We like to say secure and compliant by design by engineering in with your policy the do's and don'ts, then by design you should be more compliant and more secure if it's effectively managed. And with your collaboration cross company, you're building trust and transparency, uh, which makes it easy to collaborate and provides consistency and standardization. And also, you've got the, uh, the benchmark of you are conforming to an industry standard, which has been put together by a collaboration of all sorts of companies, like of Google, Uber, Facebook, car companies, uh, legal people. So you, you've got that kind of comfort, you're doing things in the right way, rather than doing things in the way you think is the right, the right way, if that makes sense. So you're kind of benchmarking the way you're managing software. So just to, just my final slide. So you've got the OPJ standard, which Shane talked about. A sister standard is SPDX, which is a way of representing license information and copyright information. Uh, if you no doubt most people have seen uh, license statements in GitHub and things like that, there's various ways people articulate their copyright and things like that which makes it you know, harder to interpret sometimes because we've got different ways of representing it. SPDX addresses that. There's a project in the US by the National Telecoms Institution uh, called Software Component Transparency, which is their driving standardization of what should be in a software bill of materials. So they've got some interesting content. And then uh, there's, there's a fledgling standard, which is very security focused called Cyclone DX, which is about what should be in an SBOM, particularly from a security perspective. So with that, um, any questions?